Okay, we'll start with um, Michael and move on to Cynthia. Thank you. Many thanks, Zan, and uh, Michael Van Gelderen from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, many thanks uh, to the panelists for, for the excellent presentations um, and for, for bringing this issue um, to attention during this session of the Human Rights Council. Uh, I think the, the presentations highlight the, um, the, the seriousness and the very um, broad nature of and extent of the violations, human rights violations faced um, by trans persons uh, throughout the world. Um, you know, human rights mechanisms have documented killings, torture, mm -hmm. ill-treatment, uh, the criminalization of trans people based on their identity and expression, uh, widespread discrimination in employment, in education, in health, um, and, and uh, uh, access to, to public services, uh, as well as restrictions on freedom of expression, assembly, and association. Um, Thanks also for, 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 for drawing attention to the issue of pathologization. And I think in part thanks to the work of, um, of uh, the trans uh, movement and trans civil society organizations, I think we've also begun to see uh, UN human rights mechanisms um, raising their attention to the issue. And this year there was a, a, an unprecedented statement uh, highlighting um, the, uh, both the fact that pathologization uh, violates rights, but also the linkages between pathologization and a whole range of human rights violations face, faced by trans people, which uh, Mauro, you also highlighted in your, in your presentation. Um, OECHR will, will soon be uh, uh, publishing a report which uh, comes to certain conclusions, and the report looks at how states are acting to tackle violence and discrimination uh, against uh, LGBT and intersex people. And in that report, you know, it's, a, it's not a comprehensive uh, analysis, but it, it, it looks at an overview of the information we could gather on what states are doing. And we came to the conclusion that um, state efforts to address violence and discrimination against trans people or based on gender identity and gender expression lag behind efforts to tackle discrimination and violence based on sexual orientation. So it's interesting that when looking at uh, uh, the uh, output of treaty bodies, as we saw in Xenia's uh, presentation, and when we look at state implementation of UN recommendations, we both see uh, a similar pattern of um, less specific attention to issues of gender identity and expression than uh, uh, to those of sexual orientation. And I think that is a call to action uh, uh, for uh, the UN system and for states uh, who have responsibilities under human rights treaties to address these gaps uh, and challenges. One of my questions to, to the panelists would then be, what specific actions and, and measures do you see necessary to remedy, to advance uh, uh, in uh, greater attention in the treaty bodies, for example, and the special procedures, and likewise uh, in state practice. Also, perhaps based on how have these ex successful examples come about, both in the treaty bodies and, and in state practice. Thank you. We might, let's, let's actually, sorry, Cynthia, we might answer that question first um, because it's quite a weighty one and then move on to your question if that's okay. So, would anyone like to respond to uh, Michael's question, which is, um, what, are, what specific actions and measures um, are there to remedy or to advance um, greater action in the treaty bodies and special procedures, um, as well as uh, by state practice? So, Well, I can share my experience both on the national level and also on the international level. I would say that what would be more important for activists, for activists to work on their rights uh, is more practical recommendations, not like um, eliminating all forms of discrimination in all spheres on ground of even though gender identity, but uh, more specific recommendations that could be implemented on the ground. For example, to, um, to repeal specific law that uh, is um, in, country, in the country, or to, um, 
or not to require surgery for legal gender recognition, for instance. And uh, another point also here is that it's important to uh, divide different experiences inside LGBTI communities. I've already mentioned this. But transgender people, for example, they experience specific also forms of violence or specific consequences of violence. And it also should be taken into account because, for example, from my national practice, we had a situation when, uh, well, um, the violation, violence, physical violence against uh, um, women from LGBTI community uh, has not been recognized as a violence against women, woman, women but uh, was uh, treated as violence against LGBTI people, but women in the communities or people from female spectrum, for example, they can uh, have specific they, they can experience specific consequences and uh, they can have specific factors related to their vulnerability and I think that it should also be reflected in the recommendations. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thank you for your question. Yeah, I clearly there are many different ideas about how that could happen, but I would like just to go back to Mauro's point that it would be really important to stop applying double standards to trans people in terms of the application of human rights. I think it's really important that if we see a human rights standards development across the treaty monitoring bodies and those and the UN agencies and other human rights bodies, whether they are regional courts or commissions, whenever they exist, that the principle of choice, bodily integrity, self-determination, uh, non-discrimination is being applied uh, to transgender people, rights and needs in the same way as it is being applied in any other area of human life whenever it comes to um, forced sterilization, whenever it comes to access to services, when any forced health intervention, divorce, marriage, and in other, uh, any other areas. But I think it's also time to do very con concrete actions. So to translate those principles to very concrete actions. And there are some positive uh, examples like the Argentinian and the Maltese laws. And there are other countries when they struggle and in the current political setting, it might be impossible to have those laws, but they want to make sure that they are integrated in existing legal frameworks, like if there is a new gender equality law, how the gender equality law applies across different gender expressions and identities. So I think there are many different actions and there is, for example, the blueprint for the provision of comprehensive care for trans people and trans communities in Asia and the Pacific that was a very comprehensive participatory process with trans communities of developing standards of care for trans people based on their needs and, and human rights. So how the concept of participation, depathologization, elimination of discrimination of healthcare can be translated. And, and you, UNDP is doing a nine country assessment in, in Asia Pacific on legal gender recognition. And it has been just adopted a year ago, but you can see that this is the standard document that is being used in countries as a reference document, and WHO, UNH, UNDP signed on together with many trans organizations in the region. So there are positive examples that how these human rights standards, first of all, they have to be upheld and then have to be very practically translated that, uh, that can make a difference on everyday life. Um, I know that I only have like very general suggestions, but for me, uh, really, the point of departure. One is to unpack gender, the very concept of gender, the way in which gender circulates here and is, is produced and reproduced here, to include different genders. So that would say, you know, that at the very beginning, we need, even when we keep working with the concept of gender identity, like we have three at least, you know, gender identity, gender, gender identity, and gender expression, we need to start challenging that difference that make, you know, uh, cis men and women to have a gender and trans people to have a gender identity and to analyze what it means. And this is connected to the second suggestion, which is to start introducing bodily issues and bodily rights are not only connected with 
uh, disabled people and intersex people, just to put two uh, examples, but in general, uh, m many issues that trans people uh, face are not uh, included in, a, in a, such a narrow framework of gender identity. We need to talk about people with different uh, embodiments and what that means in terms of human rights. And then, you know, that can be intersected with gender as a framework, but again, not a binary system of gender, but a framework able to recognize people with different genders and what it, what it means. Um, and the third thing, and probably it's something that needs to happen at the national level, but, you know, getting uh, substantive language, you know, and, and attention coming from UN um, mechanisms will be really necessary, is, you know, to take a decision in terms of if insurance companies are going to define the right to health or if the right to health is going to be defined in terms of human rights. In many countries of the world, and I don't want, you know, they don't have a clear statistic, but with, when we think in terms of the concerns of trans people, we think, especially in the US, it seems that what it means to have access to healthcare is defined by private actors and not, you know, the state, not you know, regional human rights uh, bodies or the international right, human rights bodies have a say on, on that. That's affecting trans population, but it's also affected other many different uh, populations facing the same challenges. So I would really like to see changes happening in, three, uh, in these three main areas. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I just wanted to highlight the issue around the state, the state practices in that it becomes quite a challenge to address these issues at the state level when it does, it does not really exist per se at the treaty level. It becomes quite a challenge. We can do advocacy work as, as, as human rights advocates at, at national level, but it becomes a challenge if, they, they, if we do not have, say, this is the evidence, this is what we have, this is the document that we can rely on to work on our advocacy work at state level. So I think what we need to push for is for the, the treaties at, U, at the UN mechanisms to work on issues of gender identity and expression for us to take it down to the state level. Thank you. Um, Cynthia, would you like to ask your question? I think my question is not as focused as Michael's. Um, it's not as articulately uh, expressed either, nonetheless. So I want to ask you something that's, that's open-ended. And Ksenia, you, you touched on this, actually. I think you read my mind. I wanted to ask each of you to say a little bit more about how you see distinctions within, within trans communities. And yes, there is that conflation, just as we all struggle with conflation about the ways in which an LGBTI acronym is used. And the experiences, obviously, are very different under, under that umbrella. Um, within, you know, within the universe of transgender people, there are also, Ksenia, as you, know, as you just most recently said, a wide range of experiences. So I wanted to ask you all an open-ended question about how you see the need for deeper specificity um, and whether you're seeing that within the context of, of UN work and human rights work or not. Um, and then related to that is, you know, this other sort of vexing question about how do we simultaneously foster attention to trans communities who are claiming the identity of transgender and at the same time foster attention to violations and um, targeted people because of what we might call gender nonconformity generally, where people aren't necessarily claiming um, identity or, uh, yeah, let, let, let me leave it at that. So, you know, it is part of that question of how do we how do we build attention also within the UN system around issues of, of gender nonconformity? How do we how do we promote that language with the assumption that that's that, that exists alongside the deeply necessary attention to gender identity and trans identity itself? 
how do we do those things simultaneously? And I suppose embedded within that, Ksenia, is also a little bit of a question to you in terms of the treaty body review that you did. I pose the question to all of you, but um, within the treaty body review, I wonder if you could say a drop more about where you're actually seeing language of gender nonconformity. Um, you know, you, you tracked the changes in, in language over, over time, over, you know, the last 20 years, really. Um, but where you're seeing language of gender nonconformity alongside the other language. Um, just to, um, mm, two comments. Um, from, from a political point of view, there's at least you know, two issues that you know, are in tension when we talk about trans and LGTB or LGTBI. Uh, one is that the LGTB acronym is an acronym that reflects uh, you know, when it is used a uh, uh, status of power inside you know these communities that seem to be you know contemporary but they usually they are not so when we say lgtb like an event can be lgtb and having no trans people involved so usually L the problem with lgtb is what we call cisexism that tends to be you know lgtb organizations like international lgtb organizations are usually uh coordinated by cis gay and lesbian people i mean that's one that's one issue then we have other different issues like for example in my case i'm a trans guy who is a gay guy at the same time but usually we are distributed into if you are trans your issue is gender identity and not sexual orientation and because what michael said that sexual orientation issues have you know more visibility uh it's very difficult to introduce gender identity when it comes to be about lgtv um and of course, the other issue is the distribution itself. When we talk about trans people, we are talking mainly about uh, what we call like gender minorities, but we are distributed all the way, you know, all the time to the sexual minorities. So the problem with trans in LGTV is that we are forced into LGTV, which means that we are not able to talk about gender issues. When it comes about how to talk about gender non-conforming people and in, in, our, in the case of hate we don't use that expression we use gender diverse for example but uh, for example the Jakarta principles only talk about sexual orientation and gender identity and that was a lost battle among other issues because we were only two trans activists an entire group of cis experts many of one many of them will describe themselves as lgtv experts but anyway gender expression was not included and that will be a great way of getting rid of the focus on identity to be you know able to talk about uh expression gender expression but otherwise gender as a category itself i think is strong enough to cover it all so that we could talk about cis people and trans people and people who identify in different identities people with non-binary uh, identities and people with different gender expressions. What we need is a politically you know, stronger use of the term gender. I think the category is already there. That's my, at least my, my impression. Um, well, thank you for your interesting, challenging question. And for me, it's also open-ended, of course. Uh, but what I think could be an opportunity is um, relying on uh, the committees that used to uh, that used to implement a sectional approach, such as uh, Committee on Elimination of Racial Discrimination, or also see the uh, the Committee on um, uh, Rights of the Persons of Disabilities, because they used to look into the problems using intersectional approach and see that there is an issue of either gender or gender identity and there are some more many others uh, factors many other factors such as race religion and so on and so on and there could be different experiences of uh, people inside the communities um, concerning language um, 
I mentioned this, that uh, still the uh, treaty bodies used to um, mention transgen t t such terms as transgender or gender identity. And uh, the very small number of recommendations related to, gen let's say, gender nonconforming people or gender expression, uh, these recommendations were about specific, either, either specific laws implemented in specific countries, for example, protecting, protecting uh, cross-dressing practices, mm -hmm. or specific cases, for example, arrests of uh, people um, on the basis of cross-dressing. But there, were no, um, there is no uh, stable language in this field still in treaty bodies. But uh, what is the great development uh, from my point of view is the um, report prepared by the uh, Special Rapporteur on Water and Health, uh, Water and san Sanitation, sorry. Uh, because here we can see all the language, uh, all the progressive language related to gender diverse persons and gender nonconforming persons, yes. So that's my answer. Yeah, I think, Cynthia, again, just to go back to a discussion what was raised in this pa panel, so I think it's really important to go to the dismantle the, 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 the roots of where uh, discrimination and human rights violation in, and non-understanding in, in relation to gender in, in generally set, but is about the patriarchal, uh, cultural, social norms of understanding perpetuating masculinity and normalizing masculinity and femininity in the society. And it's, it's very much related. So if, if we open up the gender, it comes to butch lesbians, but it also comes to disabled uh, women. That what does it mean if you can reproduce or ha can have a vaginal penal intercourse, whether you are a man, a disabled man or a disabled woman, you are a true man or a true woman, and if you cannot do that through your sexuality, you are dismissed from the gender normativity within society. So how to dismantle and deconstruct gender in a way that it doesn't perpetuate discrimination. And I think a good example, maybe Arvind, if there is time, I think the Indian example, that it was like in, there was a revolutionary, the Supreme Court judgment, the Nasa judgment in India, that reinstated the self constitutional principles of self-determination, autonomy, and freedom of expression in relation to trans people, although it started from the hijra angle, but then it straightened the trans. And now in, two, in 2016, the cabinet, the Indian cabinet uh, approved uh, a draft law on transgender human rights that is not really recognizing these principles. And certain trans expressions and identities are being excluded. For example, it would be very difficult to claim to be a trans man under this law and get the privileges what otherwise the law would provide to trans people. So I think on the, uh, what I want to say that it's really important to contextualize these gender uh, norms and human rights violations within the given social cultural context, because in other contexts, it's the Sharia law that, it's, that is reinforcing certain understanding, sometimes good, positive, uh, with positive results, sometimes with human rights violations. In other countries, like in, my, my, in many European countries, you cannot go beyond the binary. So uh, being a trans queer person, it's kind of make up your mind. We accept that you are trans, but make up your mind. You want to be a trans man or you want to be a trans woman. So there are very different perpetuations of human rights violations and societal norms. And, and that's why I think the, these need to be contextualized in, in many ways. Okay, um, we've got time for one last question from Arvind. And we have four minutes before we have to clear the room. Uh, Please. Okay. Thank you for the panel. Just a question, sense a follow up from Michael. How do we think of what the uh, gender and anti gender expression rights discourse contributes to the larger language of human rights itself? What are the principles one is hoping will give greater flesh and blood through this particular struggle? Because I think, in, in a sense, every struggle contributes something to your thinking and understanding of what human rights itself is. And that's what we are thinking in terms of what the, uh, the trans struggle contributes. 
and perhaps just two thoughts I have on the point. One is the, the elaboration of the importance of the principle of the right of recognition before the law. If you look at the jurisprudence of it, it comes from the idea that at a certain point in time, the Jews are not recognized as people before the law. So in a very similar sense, you're really talking about how do you elaborate this principle of the right of recognition before the law in the context of the trans community. I thought Mauro's point of classification was very interesting in that particular context. You're talking about classification as a barrier to you accessing the right to recognition before the law. So, looking at Kenyaka's point, uh, in terms of the treaty bodies, one of the key points might be just as Tunin elaborates the right to privacy, can we have a uh, treaty body uh, before the, in particular with the Human Rights Committee, which can look at the elaboration of the, the right to recognition as a principle, which is actually very underdeveloped if you look at the, that, that principle itself. So that's one very, very specific point. The other one, more generally, is the comment on the question of gender, which I agree with, is how do you develop this notion of gender, going back to, uh, going back to Mauro's point. The, one of the, I'd like a little elaboration on the Argentinian example, because part of the problem with uh, we, we face is the fact that as far as women are concerned, there's a specific kind of discrimination which is faced, hence there's an entire idea of affirmative action which emerges. So if, if affirmative action is there, take the Indian example, say 33, one third percent reservation of seats in lower houses uh, for women, right? Then the entire question is, for example, uh, would trans people be entitled to that as well? Who would be entitled to that particular framework of reservation? Because it ties in with a certain history of discrimination and violence. And it's very difficult to imagine the two coming together in this broader framework called gender. So just a question on that. So would anybody like to comment or answer to Ivan's question? We've got two minutes, literally. I would like to, I think the Argentinian example would be again very uh, important from the context that Ra Mauro, you often raise that how it was possible to, to raise it in the Argentinian context because the right to identity had very specific historical reasons. So I think it's really important to connect to this kind of, of historical recognition of human rights, how it can be connected to the claim of In the case of the Argentinian gender identity law, even if the law is using this uh, psychiatric concept of gender identity, um, the Argentinian trans movement connected um, this concept with the right to identity, which is a very strong concept in the normative framework in Argentina. It is connected with the situation of the hundreds of babies that were born in captivity and given into adoption to families related with the military forces. And only uh, one, 100 uh, people that now are adults are recover their, uh, their identity, which means that they have recovered the history of, you know, the, their uh, birth and, and, and adoption. And there are hundreds of still, you know, missing people out there that doesn't know about their, their origins. So <clears throat> the trans movement, instead, instead of talking about the right uh, to gender identity as something connected with a, class, a medical or psychomedical classification said that basically it was a particular case of the right to identity, which is a completely different human rights, uh, human rights framework. And connected that with the, with the definition of gender identity in the Yogyakarta principles would include the experience of the body as an integral part of a gender identity, which means that you can't detach you know, the right to recognition from the right just to incarnate your own body, even using uh, biotechnological means. Uh, in that sense, it's everything, everything uh, God put uh, together. So it's the only gender identity, law, gender identity law in the world that recognize not only like gender identity as a, as a right, but, you know, the right to bodily modifications as, you know, part of the right to ident gender identity. Um, but for example, when the Ministry of Health in Argentina decided to translate all this wonderful law, and it took three years you know, for them to establish a protocol for the implementation of the law, and then when they decided to implement th this protocol and they created a guideline, well, basically, 
it was a group of people with no connection with the trans movement, cis people taking decisions about that without the necessary expertise. So in that sense, we can say that patronization or just being considered, you know, something with someone with less value have an impact at the level of rights, but also the level of implementation. And then, you know, in the way in which policies are created and implemented and monitored. So when it comes to be about trans rights, we want to see tra not only people ex expertise, real expertise on trans issues, we want to see trans people. In that sense, this gender framework is quite uh, useful in the sense that for gender equality, it's not about getting men, like cis men, experts on women's issues. We want to see women too. It's the same for us. So that in Argentina is happening, you know, uh, with, it's, it's a different process just different than just get, getting a, a great gender identity law. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you to the panel for, for being here and thank you to everyone for your questions and your active participation and listening. Thank you so uh, much. And thank you, Sun, for your great uh, work as a moderator. Thank you very much. <laughs>